Welcome to Cut the Bull, an insightful podcast which addresses the news of the day and the cultural issues plaguing our society, bringing logic and context to these topics and discussing solutions to real or mainstream pundits. Now, here are your hosts, Charles Moe, Shamika Michelle, and Wilfred Riley. Hello and welcome to Cut the Bull. I am Charles Love with my co-hosts Shamika Michelle and Wilford Riley. And our guest this week is Barrington Martin II. He is a former congressional candidate for Georgia's 5th di- Congressional District and the host of the Barrington Report. Barrington, welcome to the show. Guys, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here this evening. Well, we wanted to have you on. I mean, I follow you on Twitter and read some of your stuff, and it cracks me up. Uh, Shamika actually thought said, you got to reach out to him. It'd be great to have him on. And I know we talked about some of the topical things we, we I wanted to talk about, and we'll get to some of those. Okay. But I want to start by you have you, you you do a lot of things that I do on Twitter, where you're just asking a series of questions, like if this happens, what about this? What do you think about this? And for some reason, you get skewered for it, which we'll get to. Mm-hmm. But you 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 talk about everything that's going on. So I just want to start off on a macro level and just get your pick your brain a bit, and have you talk about what you think is the catalyst for the problems we're facing today so what is the reason so whether we'll get to crt and abortion and the tech you know the texas law and ma- mandates and COVID, and uh, there's a lot of things out there but they all seem in my opinion to tie back to something so what do you think that is what is the bigger problem that's really pushing all this stuff forward well charles i think it's a couple of things i think is that more so now than ever people are selfish i see that over the course of the last maybe five years or so you hear terms or phrases like, you know, live your own truth, do what makes you happy. But also I think that it's more so of a, a lack of accountability and responsibility that's going on. I think that what, what we're seeing right now is that a lot of people want freedom, a lot of people want like the liberties of life, but they don't necessarily want to deal with the consequences of their actions. And so they want to place the onus on other people to share into uh, the mistakes that they make or all of the things that they mess up with in their own lives. And I think that over time, as like specific aspects of society, like media, even government, even continue to push this narrative that, um, you know, you can be selfish, you can do what makes you happy. Um, it's not your fault that you're failing. It's other people's fault that you're failing. And But don't worry about it. You know, we and other people are going to help take care of you. I think that uh, that is totally like been ingrained within the psyche of the of the collective of society and we're seeing the ramifications of this in different aspects of life so Tamika, what do you think about either the question or i mean obviously we do this every week and we talk about a lot of things but i don't remember if we talked about what is it we tend to talk about these issues but what's really driving the issues or uh barrington's response um, I think Barrington has makes a good point. I also believe that the problem is just we have too many women in charge. And I think that as a society, we just have kind of sissified, you know, society, period. So I think if we get rid of, you know, some of this uh, female leadership and get back to men taking their rightful place, things would, you know, fare better. So are you saying that there's too many women in charge? Or are you saying, saying, which I get that, you've mentioned that before, but is it also that some of the men in charge aren't really being masculine, which obviously we're right. gonna get to the patriarchy thing. So it's right. that they're taking on a different, you know, a shift in traditional roles or a different approach to things. Right, I think women have tried to make men be women. So you just hear a lot of women complaining. They want men to be more compassionate and more nurturing. Not saying that they can't, but normally those are female characteristics. So I just feel like if you be the woman and stop trying to make the man the woman, let the man be the man and do what he was put in earth to do. So that's my my take. I don't like the fact that women are just want men to be so weak and sensitive. I don't like that. You know, you know, it's funny you say, as you were saying that, I was thinking about, I'm sure you all saw it, you follow the news more than me. Gavin Newsom the other day, you know, trying to f- push back the recall, so, talking about how w- wonderful women I- women are and they do this and they're good at this and they're better at this. Let's be real, they're better at us than this and this. And I just like, somebody posted it, I just replied, I said, and after the speech, at the end of the speech, he ended by stepping down and saying, replace it with a woman, w- with a woman, or did he end by tra- say announcing his transition? 
Because those are the only two ways you're going to end 20 minutes of women are better than us and women should lead everything. And that's why I want you to not recall me and let me stay governor. It's, it's asinine. But Will, what do you think? You're on mute. Yeah, I, so I, I think there's a lot there. I'm looking forward to what Barrington has to say about a lot of these issues. But I mean, I, I think we've talked about a lot of these themes during the show in the past. I mean, the... Incre so basically, one of the issues is the dramatic increase in problems in society during the period when a lot of those old devils like racism have almost disappeared. I mean, so from 1940 to today, the illegitimacy rate for black kids, black families grew from 9% to 70. And there, there's, a, there's this attempt to blame this somehow on prejudice. It's these new subtle forms of prejudice. It's, it's the white gaze. It's white privilege, so on. But it, no serious person can believe that there's more racism today on either side, really, than there was in 1940. So the question is, what's actually happening and who's responsible for it? And I, I'm kind of interested in unpacking the guest's opinion on this. To me, the, the idea that men should be more feminine is part of a whole package of ideas that yes. involve kind of breaking up that traditional family to really get to like the utopian socialist dream state kind of speaking from the right frankly i mean you have to get rid of institutions that are in your way i mean one of those has traditionally been organized religion but one of those has been the family and so i i think a lot of these ideas generally come together so wants men to be extremely feminine and more sensitive and explore their their gender flexibility and all that that person's also very likely to support a whole range of things you yes. wouldn't think have anything to do with this at all from universal health care to drawing back the military so i i, I really want to that, that's really it for my intro i want to see what everyone on the panel has to say about how those things work together well well one thing i want to say quickly i want to talk about what i think the problem is in addition to what you said all of you are right but i think there's one other piece I may have mentioned before, but also I learned a lot by following you all on Twitter. And today, I believe it was maybe yesterday, Will tweeted something about, you know, let's just be real. The, uh, uh, we have to be honest. One thing that no one speaks about is a lot of this, you know, angst about the problems in the world. Is, and I think you said made it a point to say the alt right and the left is that none of them want to admit that things are so much better than they have been, you know, especially in the last 100 years, but, you know, before that. So we're living our best lives while we're complaining about how difficult our lives are. Actually, actually, if I can jump back in there for one line, I, I think there are two threats to civilization. And this actually isn't me. This is the Roman general Tacitus. But there's barbarism and decadence. So I think that traditionally we've worried about the problems of barbarism. I mean, our enemies going to attack us from over the frontier. You know, are, are the whites and blacks fighting in the street with weapons? You know, are the Indians going to raid? And it, it sounds kind of funny today, but I mean, until I believe it was 1910, there were more than 10 people each year attacked by wolves. You know, so those were the issues of the past. Like, how do you make a living in this harsh, tough, harsh world? And as we've become more and more civilized and softer, what you have to do is kind of cling to some of the training we used to have when we talk about masculinity, raising a family, working a job. But instead, we seem to be falling into kind of these new set of vices. If you look at how people view relationship, if you look at just physical fitness, like the percentage of Americans that are too out of shape to ever join the military that are under, say, 30. So, I mean, that's really it to some extent. Like, we, con we conquered a lot of the problems that we used to face. And now, as we face different problems, we're still trying to link them to sort of the old enemies in the past. But that doesn't make mm -hmm. a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, I, and my piece, my other piece I was going to add simply is that I think they're trying to fix human nature. I oh, think yeah. that because things got good, we used to try to stop the wolves from killing the people, as you say. We used to stop the, try to stop the barbarians at the door just banging in and trying to come and get us. Now we're like, I mean, look at the medical advances. Look at the, you know, technology we have. We're, we're on top. We're the greatest that humans have ever been. What's left out here to fix? I know you. I can fix you, right? So now it's all like how we're going to make men more feminine. We're going to make 
women do X, Y, Z. We're going to make children better. We're going to make you not think of, think about race. But, well, think about race all the time, but think about it in the way we want you to think about it and not be racist as what we call racist, but then be racist differently. But do it the way we want to do it because that will fix society. And we know we can't fix these things. So the, 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 we already know through history and through human nature what the end of this is going to be, but we sit back and we watch them try to fix human nature. Well, yeah, I think the genuine last sentence here, but I think this is something you see a lot on social media, actually. Like, the uh, the redefinition of everything gets down to, Charles, what you call this basic attempt to redefine human nature. So, I mean, I was talking mm -hmm. recently about, like, these college, quote-unquote, rape or sexual assault codes that define sex after three drinks as rape. Like, that's every second date, to some extent, on both sides, without making fun of it. I mean, like... There was an exchange recently on, like, one of my pages where someone said that, like, an 18-year-old junior college cheerleader looked attractive. This guy's, like, 35, and people started calling him a pedophile and saying, like, that's creepy, that's bizarre, son, what are you doing? So it, it's this sort of thing, like, now being a pervert means finding young women attractive. Being a rapist means going out for drinks with your girl. I'm not saying there aren't real perverts and rapists, right. but just on and on, like, racism is asking a pretty Asian woman, where are you from? And that's because of the absence of the wolves. As corny as that sounds, like we're redefining shit because the original problem, there are no white and black guys fighting in the street with brick bats, a la Detroit 43, like anywhere. So we're taking these terms that have these real deep, almost religious meanings in some cases, evil, perversion, and we're applying them to just regular everyday stuff. Like, yeah, she's fine. You know, and that, that's, that has a deep meaning, actually, because people are growing up believing this. That, like, asking women on dates is sexual abuse and so on. And this all ties into the same thing of why everyone's so shy and nervous and so on. Mm -hmm. So, Barrington, let's start with that. Let's start with a gender piece, patriarchy. I saw some tweets about that, and people were really, really upset with you. So tell me what your views are on that and why it, the way we're approaching it is hurting society and why people get so upset about it. Because what, what you tweet, it seemed really traditional and normal to me. Yes, first and foremost, I love when people get upset with me. I love it. I got, I like, I eat it. Like, I, I really get, um, like, a fix from it because I feel like, um, and going back to Shamika, and I'm glad she said this because I was trying to gauge, like, you know, just how blunt, like, bluntly honest I could be um, with this nope. topic. You can cut the bull here. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to cut it because, um, like, like men are, are, are so much more softer than they've ever been in, in my you know, like young life. Like I'm, I'm, I was raised, you know, um, by both my parents, but I, but I had my father with me and my father is a man's man. My father doesn't play any games. My father doesn't expect any BS. My father doesn't like softness, but yet I had my mother to um, comp compliment his, his parents and you know, his fatherhood teachings with me to, on the soft side for me to not go too far where he is, but to always center me, right? So when I speak about him, when I speak about my dad, when I speak about my uncles, my cousins and their fathers, like I grew up under traditional patriarchy, whereas uh, the teachings of my dad, he cloaks everybody in the household under his protection mm -hmm. in which he's very stern. He like he gives a sense of tough love. He's not going to tell you or call to you or tell you what you want to hear. He's going to be completely honest about everything. It doesn't matter if it hurts your feelings or not. He understands that um discipline is needed like when my dad maybe sometimes he got out of hand but more so than anything he instilled in all of us i'm the oldest of five that the worst thing we could do is disappoint our parents right and so just going back to to earlier when i st stated this everybody has this sense of i'm going to live my truth this is my truth when essentially the truth is the truth and it, it exists by itself and it doesn't have um you know any any attachment to anyone or any bias to it and it's amoral uh, within itself and so when i look at how patriarchy has been demonized and people look at patriarchy in a negative sense patriarchy is what keeps you safe at night it's a reason why we can go to bed and not have to worry about scud missiles or drones being attacked attacking us it's a reason why when a woman calls 911 nine times out of ten it's going to be a man that shows up and it's a reason why strong men have not only created the world not only have built the world but have protected the world from um, t t um tyrannous men it's a reason why um we have the freedoms that we have in the western world in which these particular men have allowed or have, have cultivated the type of environment to where women are protected, children are protected, and even weak men are protected.
even if, even even though I have a problem with that itself. So I just think that that it's it's really horrible how um, the man or manhood itself has been demonized when essentially manhood is legitimately uh, I would say the bones that make up society. If, if a society was the human body, the man manhood is the are the bones that keep it up, they keep it sturdy, they keep it going. Well, you know, I want to give a, an example from one of your recent Twitter uh, kind of um, post and the reaction to it, because I think it's important because okay. you, you talk about, you know, patriarchy. Right, obviously, you're trying to explain why it's not a bad thing, but the people who are against it, they like they do every topic, they skew and twist what is being said and take the bad of somebody like you say a man goes too far you see see that's that's why there's a problem with men that one man went too far and now you're saying this is the problem with all men and that's why we need to replace them with women they did that when they were attacking boys you know you know when i was in school boys would get you know get rowdy and say all right we need to get to the line we don't need to fix them or change them we need to let them learn how to be a boy and to harness that stuff for good, but to rein it in when they need to rein it in. And then the generation after me, I was lucky enough to miss it, the whole drugs and your ADD and there's something wrong with you because you're talking in right. class and all that kind of stuff. But you had, um, it wasn't yours, I think you retweeted it, but um, it was uh, what I assume a married couple, um, middle-aged man and woman, and they're at some party or event, maybe a wedding and they're dancing. And the wife turns to go start twerking and he doesn't even stop. He doesn't point his finger. He doesn't say anything. He's dancing. She does it. He just pulls her arm and pulls it back and keeps going. So you made a comment about that. We've all seen it. But the replies, the people posting, there was one guy that was hilarious. He was like, what is wrong with you all? I'm married and my wife can just, you know, do whatever she wants to do and pull her pants down. Who am I to tell her what she can do? And then, you know, so then it became this fight between people saying, you know, it's, but that's not even extreme patriarchy. It's just like, why would you allow that? It's your job to protect her. What do you mean to protect her? She could do whatever she wants to. She's a strong woman and all this kind of stuff. So the reaction to that is a great example of the type of thing we're talking about. Absolutely. And that's, I, I agree with that. Like, I have conversations like this with um, my female colleagues, my female friends alike. And I have to tell them and I have to remind them, like, you feel that you're just this strong, independent woman. But if we go out into the street and a man disrespects you and it's just me there, first and foremost, you're, no one's going to do that, like, because I'm there for one. But second most, if that happens, you're not just going to, if I, if I were to st step back and say, hey, you're an independent woman, you handle that yourself, you're going to look at me crazy because your natural instincts, your natural instincts is, are going to be like, there's a man in front of me who's a threat. I am a woman. Mm -hmm. I can't do anything about that. And like, this is, this is why I have the biggest beef with media, society, politicians, uh, black entertainers, all of this because they they pontificate the this type of rhetoric that are basically lies and our especially my generation get so caught up into these lies and when they go out into the real world they see that it's it's only a facade it's only meant to take them off track of what's what's reality um the gentleman that said that said that his his wife could choke in the air and i said you're weak you're you're a weak man and i, I have no i have like I'm, I'm not scared to say that like you you're very weak because Essentially, and I'm not saying a man is supposed to control a woman, but the greatest thing a woman can do to a man is respect him. That's the, that is the greatest thing a woman can do. And for your, for your wife, your significant other as a woman to behave that way in public in front of you, let alone behaving like that in general, but she do that in front of you, that goes to show that not only does she doesn't respect your masculinity, but she doesn't respect you as a human being to do that. And so I just think that we got to get back to the basics of, you know, what has worked and what has basically um, provided success for us to, for, as far as us having interpersonal relationships in life. And I just think that, like, over the last, I would say maybe, of course, 40, 50 years, we've watched the greatest human experiment of all time. In the, in the late 60s, early 70s, feminism taught women to be more like men. Now we've reached a point to where um, they're trying to teach more men to be like women. And we're seeing the ramifications of this to where not only like, for example, you have problems that were exclusively within the black family. Now there are problems like different races all over, like different families. And so um, these issues are, prolifer are proliferating throughout America. And if we don't get it together, I, I legitimately think like within the next five to 10 years, polygamy will make a return.
one thousand percent. Because men, men aren't just men anymore. Right, right. So, Shamika, I know you probably have some views on this because you've said some things like this before. This has got to be just ringing true to you. But I want to add to that when he talked about 911 in the streets. You can simplify. I, and you, know, you all know we talk about various topics that I always end up saying this at least once. Do they actually believe what they're saying? Now, obviously, there's true believers, but I'm like, they don't because these women are like, I can do whatever I want to do. No man can tell me anything. I can do this. I don't need him to protect me. I don't need him to raise my kids. I don't need this. I don't need this. But the moment something happens, it's all different, right? So we know that same woman at home, if she has a man that lives with her, and she hears the noise, she's not saying, stay over there, honey. I got this. I'm going to go downstairs and see what that noise is, right? So, you, so uh, right. Brianna, so, Brianna yeah, Taylor. Yeah, but then they also have expectations. It's not just that they do it. If Every, if the guy was like been hearing this in the ether so long and he's believing it, so then he's like, yeah, why don't you go do this? She's Now she's like, I can't stay with him because he didn't, you know what happened the other day? This happened. So then they paint this picture to their friends about how he wasn't a real man. So they only want him to not be a man when it doesn't directly affect them. So what do you say, Shamika? First of all, I want to say, Barrington has me wanting to go make a, a strawberry pudding or something. <laughs> <laughs> go whip something up. Right. <laughs> but, you know, I have to agree. And I notice, like, when men give me a compliment, they always lead with, I hope this doesn't offend you. And it's like, we've made men scared of being men. Why would it offend me if you're giving me a compliment? See, ugly women have made men second guess themselves. First of all, you ugly, fat, out of shape troll. You don't get to tell a man how he gets to talk to a woman that he finds attractive or is interested in. You know, because you aren't getting these compliments, now you want to you know, decide what's right for everybody or because you like compliments from women. A lot of these feminists that came out in the 60s were lesbians, period. Some of the ones that we looked up to, you know, like Nikki Giovanni, gay. Uh, Alice Walker, gay. So, you know, these are women that, you know, we kind of looked up to in, in my generation. And I'm like, wow, I had no idea Alice Walker was, was uh, dating Tracy Chapman. All I thought Tracy was doing was riding in a fast car. So it's like we're, we are, things have changed and I really want men to kind of take a stand. Now I will say I'm probably the woman that would be, you know, twerking, you know, that music sometimes. Don't let him play uh, Hot Boys, you know, back that thing up. That's gonna be me, that's my generation. But I would really appreciate a man just gently saying, uh-uh, not, no, not here, right? Not here. You know, mm -hmm. that would not, I wouldn't go off about that. I wouldn't be angry. I wouldn't feel like he was disrespecting me or trying to control me. You know, sometimes I'm not thinking clearly as, as you know, and so I need a little redirection. There's nothing wrong with that. And when you see these women that say, oh, I can do that, we, we are the same intellectually. Okay, you may have intellect, but if your lights go out, you aren't climbing a pole to restore that electricity. More than likely, a man is going to do it. More than likely, a man built this seat that I'm sitting in. So for, for me to act as if I want to do these hard jobs, I don't. I don't want to work 12 hours for anyone at any time ever period you know it's just certain things i don't want to do well stop disabling that so I, I think there are two things here i mean first of all i think there's a difference between and this is one of those things one of you maybe barrington mentioned there's a difference between what people say and like what they know to be true very often these days so I think that there's a difference between kind of the expressed feminist agenda and what almost any women want. And Shamika, being a woman, you know, said that, you know, better than I probably will. But if you just look like the most romantic success I ever had in my life was when I was the biggest asshole, like <laughs> just out of high school, still a very competent athlete, considering the military you know, fighting pretty frequently, all this stuff. And I think there are things there. Obviously, I think very few women want someone who's an abusive bad boy to them. And that's something for men to keep in mind. But the whole romance genre is based around this idea of, like, he was a killer, but not with me. Like, the hero's always, like, a pirate, a cowboy. He just got back from World War II. So I think those things, the original gender roles were that women gave life and men took it. And both were important. 
So I think that even though today we might not want nine children as men, or we might not want our husband working as a soldier or professional hunter or something like that, you still like the idea that the person you're with is fit to live. Like they're mm -hmm. able to do those things. So this stuff, when you mentioned that a lot of the early feminists were, they were not only gay, which I have no issue with at all, but it suffered very significant abuse. If you read things like The Color Purple, and they were articulating this idea of sort of soft, loving, caring people, women or bisexual men that wouldn't hurt them anymore. And this became kind of this image of what feminist masculinity should be. It's okay for boys to cry. The reality is that whether you're talking about something academic like Twitter or survey monkey polling, or whether you're just talking about people look at in the club, is it going to be a tall, rich guy? There, very few women seem to want this. And there's nothing wrong with acknowledging this. There's nothing wrong with saying, as a man, I've said some of these things to myself recently. I mean, you need to, you need to get back in the gym. You need, to, you need to bone things up at the office. You need to become more of what a man is or has traditionally been considered to be. And that's what women are going to react to. And if you're a leader of men, that's what men are going to react to. Um, so a final thing about this twerking example. It's weird to me with a lot of these situations where what you have is kind of a one-sided policy where it's considered to be okay for women to critique men, but not for men to critique women. You're now seeing this even in the racial arena where, you know, whites and POC have sparred for decades, but now the idea is, you know, you can say anything about, you know, this dominant evil Caucasian culture. But if someone comes back and says, Jesse Waters, a guy I talked to recently, comes to mind, like somebody who's obviously not racist, but he's a right-leaning Caucasian guy, says, you know, there's a lot of crime in the hood, then there's going to be an incredible outcry. You can't say that. No, you've crossed the line. So I think in reality, if you're talking about free people, you can tell anyone anything productive. If I was at a party as a man over 35 and I'd had too much to drink and I was acting like an asshole, I was yelling at people, I was talking on at length, as you guys can probably imagine, I had a <laughs> bottle in my hand. You know, I would want my girl or my wife to take me by the arm and say, you need to stop drinking for a while. And there are ways to say this. Do you want to take a nice walk with me? You know, it's it's lovely outside. Let's, let's look at the moon together. But like, I certainly wouldn't want her to just tolerate that because a woman shouldn't criticize a man or something like that and a man because we're not inferior to women has the exact same right to criticize a woman of course if you know someone's wearing a business dress and slim or no underwear and starts twerking at a party there they're going to be a lot of opinions they might have about that later so taking them by the arm and saying not right now hon absolutely legitimate on a date at the club whatever so uh, again everyone knows that it's just can you say it in public and that that's so common so you, you brought up the fact that men should be able to have an opinion. Perfect segue. So apparently Texas passed a, an abortion law recently, and um, there was a lot of um, uh, anger on both sides, uh, either defending it or whatever the case may be. But what I find interesting is the reactions and the way people think. I mean, because, you know, politicians are going to do whatever they're going to do. But, I mean, you're going to win some, lose some if you're left or right. But... It's the reaction. It's the men that, that try to, on the one hand, say, well, as a man, I shouldn't have an opinion and I shouldn't have a say, which is weird because if men are in, 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 the, in the, you know, role of uh, leadership, they're going to have to make some decisions that affect women. It may not be specifically to their body, but you're going to make a, a, a policy that is um, surrounding education. And most of the people who are most involved in the, in the uh, children's schooling is, is, is mothers. So, I mean, mm -hmm. you can't act like nothing that you're going to do. is a, You can't pass any laws or uh, push any legislation that affects women. But they, they try to say, well, who, who is it for me to say? I can't say, and those guys in Texas are wrong. But then they go on to say all this stuff about what women can and can't do in other areas. Then there's the whole whether, whether women can have, are the only ones who can get pregnant, right? AOC's crazy responses. And, and it's just shocking how so many men are either, like you say, being passive or saying, I don't have, it, I don't have an opinion because of, I don't get to have an opinion because I'm a man, so I don't have a right to say anything. So what are your thoughts to, on, on that, Barrington? Charles, these men are weak. I, I will forever say they're weak. They're soft. They're timid. I could feel it while reading the, their words through the screen. I, it, I hate it. It, it. it makes me, like, it makes my stomach hurt, like, when I just see how, how soft men are. It's like, you're totally forgetting that as a man, 
as a heterosexual man, especially with a woman, you have a part in her getting getting pregnant. Therefore, that child that is being cultivated within her body is basically due to your actions as well. And so for you to totally absolve yourself and absolve your future child and say, well, it's not my body, it's her body. What do you that is ridiculous. Um, I read I read the bill. Of course, there are some things um, that I don't like. But ultimately, I don't really have a problem with it because I think that, again, people don't want to have accountability or, or responsibility for themselves. If you are having sex actively, you should automatically know, especially as an adult, that you can get someone pregnant or that you will get pregnant. I'm not understanding this notion, um, especially for, for what I understand about um, women and their cycles and things of that nature. I personally believe if a woman is in tune to her body like she should be, and if she goes to the doctor and gets checked up while she's having sex, reckless sex at that as she as she is, then she should automatically know that it's a huge possibility that she could be getting pregnant based on her actions alone. And so even again, as a man taking on that leadership role, if you are my lady and we are having sex, and I know that we live in this state, I'm gonna always say, do you need to go to the doctor? Do you need to get checked up? It's it's, it's just certain things or certain measures that that can be put in place that can prevent pregnancy. And so when I see men automatically, like, because I'm not going to lie, like, I used to think like that. I used to think, of, well, I, I don't have a say in what a woman does her body, but essentially that baby could be a, a productive citizen in society. And I feel that ultimately... Um, you know, a woman should have complete agency of her body, but there should be some type of penalty paid by killing another life. That's just me personally. Well, uh, another problem I see is, I don't know the specifics of, uh, like I said, I didn't read it. You did better than I did. But I know that there's always some timeline. You, you really, if, if, you, if you're not attacking each other and you're just approaching this in a really honest and truthful way, the debate between the most normal people is when, or what's the, or what's the, the line you draw. But I heard a lot of people on the left saying, the people on the, this is not about life. They don't care because they don't do this after they're born. They don't take care of them. They're not, you know, you know, Bo uh, bolstering welfare and they're not doing all this which are separate issues but mm -hmm. but what i find interesting is is we all to the, if you go the other way we all forget that several people you know there was a, a legislation the other way you know what new york and virginia and all those places we forgot about that where they were basically said remember how about this 2016 when hillary ran against clinton i mean against um uh what's his name trump see i forgot his name when hillary ran against trump that's when those laws were uh, being passed in those liberal states and all the people on the right were mad. It was just the opposite of the Texas law. And so they asked Hillary, what do you think about, you know, abortion all the way up until the, the due date? And she was kind of hemming and hawing and said, well, I'm not saying I like it, but she basically said, yeah, you can do it because, you know, you know, you're not a baby until your due date, so to speak. So to have this argument about 13 weeks, 14 weeks, 20 weeks, 30 weeks, and, and, and which is fine to have that debate. You got to draw the line somewhere. But to have that argument on Twitter and in, in, in social circles and act as if there's not a grow, not very large, but somewhat large and growing percentage of people that's just like cool all the way up to the end is, you know, completely disingenuous. We know they're out there. The governor of Virginia was one of them. Hillary Clinton was another. There's several others. If you go back and find the tape, they're like, yeah, so your due date is October 3rd. You can have an abortion on October 2nd. And no one talks about that. They're arguing about whatever line that the, the Texas law draws. So mm -hmm. if you're going to be honest, be honest. So you're saying, Barrington, that the women should know their body. And I, a lot of reasonable people are saying, you know, I'm not saying they shouldn't be able to do it at all. But there's got to be some point. What we do. Would you agree that there's some point where you can stop it and you can't have that conversation anymore? So, Samika, what are your thoughts? Well, first of all, I want to tell men, if you are having sex, unprotected and the woman says come in me she's lying don't do it pull out it you know blood leaves our brain and pools in our genitals as well so don't believe her okay we make mistakes too i want men to understand that but you know i do feel like men should have the right to decide i mean of course you have men that you know make these decisions for, for anything so I don't know why we would leave them out of this when it takes two to tango and it takes two to make a baby and as Barrington was saying 
women should know their bodies each and every time. Listen, I've had an abortion and I knew exactly what I was doing. And that's why I said, don't listen to us. You know, we say some crazy stuff. Um, I knew exactly what I was doing when I did it, and I knew that I was fertile each and every time. If you pay attention to your body, if you know your cycle, then you know that if you've had unprotected sex, there's a high chance that, you know, you're pregnant. I know when I ovulate, I can actually feel it. And so I just think this idea that women want to walk around as if, you know, they're, they're stupid and they don't know what's going on. And, oh, my God, you may be five, six, seven months. Normally, that's not the case. Normally, you know that you've had sex unprotected and there's a chance that you can be pregnant. And if you pay attention to your body, you know right away when that 28th day comes, if that's what your cycle is and there's no period, oops. I may be pregnant. Let me go ahead and check this out and see what's going on. That's well before there's a, a heartbeat detected. So, you know, I'm really, and what I'm tired of as well, let me mention this. I'm tired of people using rape. Well, what if, you know, what if they were raped? Can we just come up with the reason that you want to be able to kill your baby? Can you just say and stick to my body, my choice? If that's the reason, stick to that. Stop coming up with these excuses because, as I understand, rape is like 1% or less than 1% of abortions. Mm -hmm. So stop using that as your excuse because, first of all, I'm a product of rape. So I'm tired of hearing, like, I'm not supposed to be here, yeah. you know, because, you know, find something else. Right, right. That's true. And, um, uh, Will, any comments on those? And in the added piece for the people who are saying that, um, well, it's the woman's choice. 100% men have nothing to say. So some men are countering, well, then if she decides not to abort the baby and I didn't want the baby, is it my choice to just not support the baby? So where do I get any kind of say? So uh, what do you think about all this? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think obviously men can have an opinion on abortion. This is another one of these sort of corny, woke statements where people are expected to step back and say that, you know, that's not my issue. I don't know your struggle. I mean, saying that men can't talk about women's issues is like saying women can't talk about war. Do you think it's justified, something like that? Mm -hmm. Or the availability of condoms and other birth control on campus. So, of course, guys can talk about this. The actual issue itself is kind of complicated. So first, I personally, and obviously I am a man, uh, although I like to think no one assumed my gender before I said that. But like, when, in terms of what Shamika said about you understand the risk of sex, Barrington as well, like my freshman year of college, I asked my girlfriend what her birth control plan was, and she said, I swallow. And it was kind of a joke, but it was also real to a certain extent. Like, if it stopped 30 seconds before and that happens, and you return the favor, you're both pretty happy. No kids. So, I mean, the idea that there are things like oral sex, anal sex, wearing a condom, birth control, that everyone who socialized in high school is familiar with. And the time. Whatever time the Texas law is given, you also have that time. Yes. But I mean, like the idea that it's very, very difficult to prevent a pregnancy absent something like rape or incest, like I really don't think that's true. Like I actually, as a consultant, have broken down some of the abortion data and Shamika's figures correct. It's actually rape, incest and life of the mother combined. When you look at things like tubal pregnancies, that was 1.2 percent of abortions. Mm -hmm. So most abortions, most abortions occur in the first trimester. The reason is something broadly defined, like general need. And it, it, there is an element of birth control to it. Um, I actually, I, I'm pro-choice. Like, I think if you actually pull up a picture of a blastocyst, I have one on my Twitter, you know, five, six weeks in, any of this, it's very hard to argue that that's a human. And to say things like, you know, he had a name, he had a face. I, I, don't, I don't find that to be medically true, although I understand, you know, people of goodwill can dispute this. But the, the point that there are limits and caps you can put on abortion, I think that's why I'm going to end this, because I'm kind of doing the mushy centrist part here. The idea that there are caps you can put on abortion and so on is obviously true. One of the things that makes this discussion so hard to have is that the official position of groups like women now is no, you can't. Like yeah. there, have been, there have been female candidates asked, like, do you support abortion until labor begins? And they've hemmed and hawed and then said yes. And that, that is crazy. 
you know, some mm -hmm. choice rights, Plan B, all that, I think 90% of the population supports. But, yeah, people very often do know when they're pregnant. And even if it's not six weeks, I don't support six weeks, there does have to be an upper cap on that. You can't walk into the doctor eight months in and say, I just didn't know. That's totally implausible. I mean, that, that is where the practice becomes birth control. There are a lot of people in the hood, thinking back to East Aurora, Chicago, that have had five or six abortions. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, in the old Soviet Union where their birth control wasn't easily available, people kind of didn't care to press the side. People would get up to 11, 12. That's not good for your body, but I can't imagine it's good for your mind or, quote, unquote, soul either. So you, you have to put some checks in there. Right, yeah. That, that mm -hmm. was my point. I, I mean, I, I encourage anyone watching and listening to go and Google them and find those people who actually said birth any time before the date. You know, and we want to really get crazy. We can talk about the guy at the University of Chicago and some of the others who are talking about you should be able to uh, – get rid of your kid you know, you know like like infants like well, you know it, it moved from the down syndrome thing so you know even whatever reason this is this is the problem with getting rid of morality totally like you guys have te teased me a couple of times about being an amoral businessman on this show but like when you just say when you take the major like top 10 as it were moral rules and you just say to hell with that you have a lot of trouble ordering society so, I mean, like Barrington said, I expect polygamy to be on the docket, to be something that's considered that women talk to you about, you know, I'm poly within about 10 years. Um, I'd say if somebody still goes out on occasion, more like five. But once you say that there really aren't that many restrictions on relationships, I mean, you don't have to be in a relationship of any kind to sleep with multiple people. You know, I, I support this one, but gay marriage is legal, so on down the line. What's the moral argument for not? having legal polygamy and it, it's the same thing here i mean if you say it's a woman's right to choose it's just it's just a bunch of cells what what's the argument for not extending that to nine months there there are arguments but i don't think most people know them and it's it's a damn slippery slope shamika i was just gonna say can we have a show where we talk about polygamy because that's an interesting topic i think and i would like to talk about it i know some polygamists but um of course you do why would I'll, bring, I'll bring my girlfriends. <laughs> Not all of them, just four of them. We, I mean, we can't have too many people here. I'm just going to sit here with two women that are actually just casual friends of mine to look cool. And just have them sit here. Give me a drink, honey. <laughs> so, uh, Barrington, the last, you know, 20 minutes or so, I think we got to talk uh, We got to talk a little bit of race. I mean, you, you also have some pretty strong opinions about the problems in the black community. The things people have, for some reason, started to tolerate, and you get a lot of pushback on that. I, I see a lot of people calling you all kind of names, and uh, again, just asking a simple questions. So let's talk about that. Talk about some of the problems you see, some that are new, some that are worse, some that are you know, you know, decades old, and why why we can't solve the problems because you know we're not really paying attention what what's really causing them. Okay, I just want to say before I start, I have the greatest thread on Twitter thus far, and it's probably going to end up being the greatest thread of Twitter all the time, basically displaying that um, my, my thesis, my working thesis, that um, the most racist people in America are black people, and that it's because black people are racist against their own people, to which I have about, since over the last two months on a daily basis, I get called all types of coons, hard, N words with the ER, and these are just from black people. And I just, it's, it, it makes me laugh because... Essentially, I don't even say anything disparaging about black people. I just ask questions mm -hmm. or I state an opinion or I say encouraging words. One of the things that I feel like one, one of the biggest issues of the black community, quote unquote, because I know you guys have heard me say there's no such thing as a black community either, but I also believe that there's no such thing as a white community, Asian community, LGBTQ on and so forth, is that we were on an upward tra trajectory from the late 1800s and we peaked out in the 1960s. It's when the Civil Rights um, Act happened, when the Voting Rights Act happened. That's when we basically got a chance to have our sense of agency within this nation. From from 1965 on now, we have been on a, on a steep decline. And this is because I would say back in those days, there was a sense of unity and a sense of understanding that there was no help from anywhere else and we had to do everything ourselves. The moment that the government stepped in and gave us our rights and, and gave us our freedom, so to speak, what we're seeing now is that especially I get this on social media a lot. 
is that many people who claim that the government who claim that white people are their oppressors are looking for white people to, to give them a hand and lift them out of their um, despair when essentially their failures and their despair are due to their decision making are due to their um, lack of impulse control are due to the fact that um, we, we have a tendency as a community to um, I forget what it's called, um, but Yes, we, 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 we have a, a problem with instant gratification. We don't know how to look in the future. We don't know how to look and see what we want for later. And we need everything now. And this is on specifically on the economic basis. And so when you see all these issues that occur within the black community, when you hear on the news about someone white um, doing something negative to, the, to, to black people, it's funny to me how we get up in awe and how we're ready to march down the street. But yet, yet and still, I live in Atlanta on a night on a night to night basis. Someone black gets murdered by someone black, but you don't see Black Lives Matter marching in the street for them. You don't see anyone actually saying anything about it. It's kind of sort of, it's almost in a sense of that it's almost accepted. And I think that um, also one of the biggest issues contained within the black community is that the deplorables of our community get a chance to have the platform. You don't see this with any other culture, any other community. We have a tendency to, to praise those that do the most harm um, within our communities. And it's almost in a sense of where if you speak out against that, you ain't black. Shout out to Joe Biden. Um, then, give him his credit. Give him his credit. <laughs> you you got to you got to because he he's a chancellor of blackness for him saying that and then black people going out and voting for him in record numbers. But I'm not gonna get on that. Then on top of that, like I feel like um within the black community itself, the black man is the most undermined man within his own community. He doesn't even get respect from from other black men. Doesn't even get respect from other black women. And lastly, because I don't want to take up the time because I could talk about this all day, mm -hmm. you are not allowed to criticize a black woman. Sure. Under any under any circumstances, black women, um, if, if you guys forgot, they saved the nation in November. Black women are the backbone of democracy. Don't don't forget. Don't forget. So we, we have we have to pay our homage to black women for saving us yet again, as they always do, as a lot of these writers, uh, black writers on The Washington Post or these other major publications put out s such rubbish saying these things. And I, rem I, I remember saying something last um year along the along the lines of what this does is set a precedent amongst black people where when black women are getting this type of praise they tend to allow it to fill their heads and it's like oh i don't it, it reemphasizes oh i don't need a man because we're out here doing big things when you get articles speaking about how black women are the most educated um demographic or how they they are the most um enrolled in college and you don't say anything like they're the legitimately only demographic that's praised like this. You never hear this about white women, Asian women, Jewish women. It's always black women. You have to kind of sort of take a step back and say, what does this do to interpersonal relationships within black culture? What does this do to how black people correspond to each other, especially black men and women? And we've had a tendency to not go within internally to solve our problems we feel that all the answers are externally when we are e essentially the people that are creating the problems for ourselves wow that was a mouthful um important though and true i think that um what i see when i see the comments outside of the name calling my biggest frustration is that you know i care about solutions and and not only do they not offer any if they're yelling at you you can't really get them to talk if they're extremists but if you ever get a chance to talk to them to say, so what should we do? They don't have anything because they haven't even given it thought. Mm -hmm. They were so they spent so much energy being mad about mm -hmm. some things that they should be mad about, some things that they're not mad about. But they're so mad about whatever. It's like, ooh, the white man, ooh, Trump, ooh, this. It's like, uh, so what should we do about the the the, the lack of um, um, an equal graduation rate in the black community as compared to others. What should we do about crime in the community? What should we do about entrepreneurship? Well, well, we need to do for ourselves. So how does that work? Well, mm -hmm. first thing we need to do is get the government to pass it. Whoa, 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 whoa. You just said we should do for ourselves. And then the first thing on the list was the government. Well, they owe us. So they got to do their part and then we'll do our, we do our part after? What exactly does our part kick in? So Will, Shamika, what do you think about what Barrington had to say? You have to go, Will. You can go first. All right. Well, not not for like ten or twenty minutes, but yeah, yeah. sure. Um, what do I, 
Always down to talk. What do I think about that? I mean, so the underlying point Barrington makes a lot, and I absolutely agree with this as a citizen and as a black man, is that there are a lot of problems in the black community. One, these are always blamed on racism, the white man, the government not doing enough, whatever. Two, and three, that's almost certainly not the case because all most of these problems did not exist years ago when ethnic conflict between blacks and whites was much worse. Yes. Almost all these problems exist for poor whites or urban Italians and Puerto Ricans and so on, a hundred other groups, yes. Mexicans, Mexican Americans today. So we've got we've got to look at what's actually going on. And I, I'll give my opinion on what that is in a second. But I do think a part of the problem here is it's not even just this idea that you can't criticize black women. It's this idea that you can't talk honestly about a whole bunch of things. Uh, affirmative action comes to mind, male-female relationships comes to mind, crime rates comes to mind. For that matter, so do a lot of things in the Caucasian community. No one, either in the Hotep black movement or in the white kind of alt-leaning right, wants to talk about the massive poor white population that, that's struggling in the USA. That doesn't really boost anyone's agenda. But I mean, so in terms of getting back to the minority part of this, uh, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the other day said... Can you imagine everyone being held to the same standard academically as black women? And I, I, I love my black women, but like if you're familiar with affirmative action, that, that's a ridiculous statement. I mean, the, the group that has the most trouble getting into college, getting into university is Asian Americans by mm -hmm. hundreds of points ahead of whites and blacks. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you told the average Asian guy like Kenny Shu, who we had on this show, how would you feel about being held to the same tough standard as a strong black woman? He would fall on the floor laughing and he would, he would go for that in seconds. So let's do it. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think that very often sort of quote unquote concerned white liberals say things to sound good and make themselves feel good. And they don't necessarily expect these things to be taken seriously. An example might be something like this, like the highest IQ community in the USA is black women. But when people hear those things, they often believe them. And that's what, this, this is, I guess, my final point. That's what creates this narrative of all-encompassing racism. You have people that are constantly being told stuff like this, like the smartest, highest IQ group in the USA is black women. And you look around, and you see black women aren't doing badly, 95% the income of white women or whatever, but you still are asking yourself, well, we're the best. You know, we're, we're held to the toughest standard. We're outperforming everyone. Why aren't we rich? Why are we still living here in ordinary working class neighborhoods? And the easy explanation for that becomes this kind of hidden, subtle racism that's everywhere. And th this is the underlying root of that narrative. Basically, people are lying about the actual problems. The actual problems mm -hmm. have gotten worse over the past 50 years. And the dishonesty makes it easier to prop up sort of universal racism, this, this ghost in the machine, as, as what's going on. Mm -hmm. So that's so, my well, take. Jamaica, I'm coming to you, but you're going to give me your thoughts. But I got to say one other thing, because, you know, obviously the vaccination, the mandates and all that stuff around the government. So we always talk to, and Barrington mentioned it, I say it all the time, we always talk about the people complaining about what's going on in the black community, not wanting to talk about solution, blaming Whitey. Where'd you go? Um, but... There's also, the, the, we talked about the other pieces, they want the government to fix it. But am I wrong? But isn't there a heavy strain of, I don't know, distrust of the government in the black community? So, so we want the group who's least likely to trust the government, to rely on the government to fix the problems that they're having in the community that aren't necessarily created by the government. Isn't that also a part of it? I'm hoping you can hear me because I can't see you. Shamika. See, you should have gone first. Now you're gone. Charles, I want to add something to what you said, though. Yeah, go ahead. Because you, again, you have the people that distrust the government the most looking for the government to fix the problems in their community that they feel that the government essentially created themselves. So it's just nothing but this like maze within a maze of hypocrisy that like no one ever wants to be honest about. And that's, and that's the thing. It's like, um, as Wilford was saying, we never get a chance to speak openly and honestly about about issues. Like, for example, let's t let's take um, defund the police. For example, I hated that that entire phrase or the entire thing um, going behind that. Shamika, you back? Go ahead. I want because I want to hear your thoughts. <laughs> you want to hear what you have to say? Don't go yes. away. <laughs> yes. 
No, I I was just thinking when you were talking about not being able to criticize black women, I could see the episode, the the part in the color purple where Sophia came marching through the cornfield and she was knocking, you know, the corn to the side and she got to Miss Seeley and she goes, "You told Hoppo to beat me," and I just feel like not literally. But I think it's really just time to start slapping down black women because, first of all, if you're that smart, why are you alone? Why are you fuck ups if you're this these great people, you know? And I just think it's really time to start putting women in their place. You know, I guess I'm black because I didn't vote for Biden. But, you know, it's time to start in place, you know, and I think that women, we, we don't know our place, and I just thought about that when, when he was talking, like, you can't criticize black women, and they, we are out of control. When you see these videos, of uh, they're in nice restaurants, and they're twerking on the tables, and, you know, fighting, and I, having abortions, having abortions. <laughs> In the restaurant. Right. And with legs propped up on the table, you know, the waiters having to pull the baby out. You know, it's like, it's time for somebody to, to rein us in, you know. And so that just came to mind. You know, it's, it, you know, when when Harpo went to uh, Miss Seeley, she said, beat her. So that's what I'm telling the men today. Beat her. <laughs> <laughs> not literally, you know. I'm not just, not just, that she really <laughs> means it. <laughs> but, but that's that's what it's time to do. But yeah, it, it, it is just this crazy mix of it's all race. We need the government inside the race. There's certain groups that are you know better than others, right? We're not we're all equal, but some are more equal than others, right? You know, it's like Black Animal Farm. It's like, come on, we know the women need to lead and the women need to run the house and women are getting more degrees and women are better at this. So we should just let the women women lead because the future is female, right? But it, but where does that leave the black man? Gosh. Right? Where does it leave them, right? So they're still going to exist. They're still there when they do make it to the point that they have the child and they don't have an abortion. You still got 50% of the population, so you're still popping out boys. So those boys are going to become teens. They're going to be raised by women. They're going to go to school where all the teachers are women. So they're going to be surrounded by you know, matriarchy, you know, and then you're going to have, you know, they're not going to church, so they're not getting a male role model there. So, so, so then what happens? And then they go off to college or they don't go to college. All the girls get all the degrees. They're remaining in the neighborhood, and then they're starting the same cycle. So how do we break that? What do you do to kind of, you know, throw a wrench in that and at least stop the machine before we even start to move it back. How do we stop that, Barrington? Charles, I said this the, these this exact thing last year and got crucified um, for it. I mean, it was so bad that, like, celebrities were talking about it on podcasts because I was explicitly saying that when you grow up in or when you possess a culture that's a matriarchy that the black community is, and you look and you're a little boy your dad's gone so it's your mom raising you and you watch tv and you see the news the media saying how good black women are how powerful black women are as a little boy as a little black boy what are you how are, how's your self-image going to be how, how are you going to see yourself if, if you see that a woman your mom is not only doing the motherly things but the fatherly things it's going to make you like really question not necessarily your existence but your place in the world when I said this, I got crucified for it. A year later, we are watching this play out in real time. So to answer your question, I think again, we have to go, we have to go back to basics. Like we, in, in some form or fashion, we have to make interpersonal relationships among black men and black women to be more palatable um, amongst both sides. That means everybody has to do their own self work. Everybody has to really confront the issues that they have, no matter how bad those issues are. That means that everybody must be honest with themselves. That means black men must understand that they need to step up and be men and that means black women must step up and be women like why are you like why are, why have women in general not just black women have gotten so much confidence where they can feel that they can just like go up in a man's face and say whatever they want to say as if they can like just beat this man down when he has 75 100 pounds on her why is it that women have so much confidence now 
that they feel that they are more, they are even more masculine than the men like within their own communities. So I just think that like it's it's going to take um, an all hands on deck approach because there needs to be, and I hate saying this because I feel like when this when this is said, it's a broad approach. But there's a lot of healing that needs to start happening within the black community. But it only it only is going to happen on an individual level at first because everybody needs to do that work and everybody hasn't do that work there's a lot of pain there's a lot of hurt there's a lot of people who have grown up in single parent homes who have watched their mother struggle who have watched their fathers walk out on them and automatically just attach themselves to that trauma of that whatever parent that there is so i just think that like we we have to get these kids we have to stay as close to these kids, especially these young boys. We have to train these young boys the right way. But at the same time, we have to mend these broken relationships that we see in the community. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that, you know, there's a lot of problems. So obviously there's a lot of things that need to be done, which is part of the problem because you can't, can you really do all these things? And when you do it, it's going to take, it took a long time for this decline, as you say, to happen. It's going to take a long time for it to, so you're going to do all this work. You're not going to, you're going to have days where you don't see any progress, but you got right. to keep pushing. So it's going to be a while. You got to have to wait. But if I had to just pick some things like, like Charles, you're in Charles. What do you do now? Uh, uh, oh, you talk to people. What do you tell them to do? I say, stop condoning bad behavior. Find a way to get men and the kids uh, uh um, lives, which means you can't just instantly create fathers or people who live at home, but maybe we need more male teachers again. When I was growing up, we still had male, male teachers. At least that's the one place they have to go. So maybe we need to put men in the school. We need to stop condoning bad behavior. We need to get away from the race thing, not stop talking about race, but stop blaming race for the problems that exist, right? So, because I can't control, even if they're right, I can't control. If white people really hate us, I can't, I, I'm worried about my kid and I'm worried about my job and making ends meet and taking care of my family. I can't also worry about every white person that I see and look at them thinking if they're out to get me, I can't worry about that, mm -hmm. right? And we have to, lastly, we have to be against the violence in our community. So mm -hmm. you say whatever you want to say about whatever, you can be all for criminal justice reform and I don't want anybody locked up for nonviolent things. That's all fine, but you don't mean that. Again, I go back to do they mean what they say? Because they say, we don't want people locked up for nonviolent offenses. But then a the guy's got, you know, warrants for, for, for beating his wife, rape, and shooting somebody. In my, well, when I grew up, when I was younger, that used to be considered violent. Maybe violence has changed because nobody's saying anything about this stuff. We don't turn anybody in. We, we fight to get them all out. Mm -hmm. And we don't want these, uh, I mean, right. we're condoning these Democrats who are talking about we need to release people from the prison. Where do you think they're going to go? Right. Right. So, I mean, I think that's the four things you start with and then you build from there. Will, mm -hmm. Shamika, anything else you all want to say? No, I agree with you. You know, I think uh, I, people hate saying black on black crime, but still, it's been a year since my best friend's son was murdered. Uh, he was 15 years old. He was killed by another black person and black people were out there. They saw it. No one would tell, although they know who it is. And so, you know, of course, had this been a white police officer that shot him, you know, the city would have been burned down. But yeah, that's we just silly. see so many people being killed around here and nothing's done. Have you all seen Chicago last week? Did you all see Chicago? Oh, yeah. I think I think nine kids under 10 got shot this weekend. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And we don't want to talk about it. And we get upset when white people say it and we say, oh, mind your business. You have nothing to do with that. But then we're not minding our own business. So if we want, you know, we don't want white people to mention it and say anything about it, then we need to correct it. And right. as long as we act like it's not happening, nothing's going to change. And so it irritates me when people get offended because I'm like, people are dying. While you're mad and while you're in your feelings and while you're whining, people, little kids are dying. Old ladies sitting on their porch just trying to, you know, have a good time, knit or crochet, are being murdered because of stray bullets and people just not knowing how to act. So it's definitely something that we have to, to change. Right. And, you know, again, I think the masculinity is, is there. And sometimes if you don't know, you know, if they, if they haven't learned how to handle it, these are the things that they do. They act out because, you know, they don't know what else to do. See, that's the key. When I was talking earlier about those boys that are now considered ADD, that's the, that is the problem. You talk about something you can't say, that is the problem. Women can do a great job of being single mothers, raising the household, you know, balancing the budget, feeding the kids and all that stuff. But it's funny 
And I wrote about this in my book before I said that it's interesting that women can say, talk about the bond they have with their daughter and raising them to be a woman and, and having these little dressing up and doing makeup together and doing all this wonderful stuff, this girl stuff together, this bonding thing. And all the women would say, that's so beautiful. But for a guy to say he does that, he has that same role in his son's life and thinking that a boy, for me to say that the boy needs that, now I'm anti-woman. Why can't the woman do it? Because she's not, just like I've never been a woman, so I can't be the same to my daughter, there's things I can bring to the table, but I've never been there, right? You know, you know I'm gonna go to mom because you've never been there. Well, the same thing goes for the son. So if I, when I talk about the key at that young age is how to still be a man, but hardest that, I'm not telling you to not, that is bad. I'm not telling you it's toxic, but I'm telling you, you, part of your job is being a boy and growing to manhood is to learn how to manage it. Mm -hmm. So if the woman can't teach him to manage it, that's part of what you get. So that is a really a key thing you mentioned. But to the black on black crime thing, I never mentioned it. And I'll give them the argument, the, the people who don't like it, because it's, for whatever reason, the phrase has become political. So I never say it. But what did I say, though, Baron? I just simply say violence. There is violent crime and violent criminals in your community, and you're being passive. I don't give a damn what they look like. I never said they were black. I'm just saying if somebody shoots an eight-year-old, then everybody should be trying to find out putting up their own money to put up a reward to find that person the the, the worst thing we see in here we all see it not white but just black anybody who watches the, the local news it repeats itself guy gets shot a week later they find a the guy they say remember the guy that got arrested that, that got shot last week well the police have found the guy he had a long record this is his third felony offense he had two gun charges and all that and we all every one of us in america has heard that thing at least four times so the question is, why aren't we like, well, why wasn't he in jail the first time? That's not a race issue. I don't care what he looks like. If he shot that last guy, and, and then we find out that the people who are pushing for criminal justice reform, trying to get nonviolent people out of jail, also swept those people up and got them out of jail. Right? I just saw something in the news the other day that the guy just uh, got into an altercation in, in Minneapolis. Got out the car, they pulled on the side of the road, shot the guy and killed him. When they called him, he was somebody that got uh, released from that fun that they were releasing people from and uh, doing the riots. I mean, and, and then the guy quoted saying that, I really don't care. I don't even look at the charges. I just want to let people out. So you are detriment to the community if you can't so if you can't draw a line between violent and nonviolent, then stop saying that you just want to help the nonviolent because you don't know what the nonviolent is. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, if, if you can't have a safe community, the schools and the business and everything else fall apart because people are living in anarchy. And then that, that's going to take a psychological toll. Will, you want to say something before you, before you go? I'm getting upset now. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's worth getting upset about, man. But yeah, I mean, one thing that I, I act important from all this, somebody jokingly used the term toxic masculinity. I think in almost every case, as an adult man, as someone who's been a coach, teacher, so on, in inner city settings, toxic masculinity is almost always untrained, fatherless masculinity. Like, it's the chasing girls, the gun fights, the Wild West stuff, the fist fighting that men get up to without a strong dad or role model to talk to them and teach them and sometimes kick their ass. Toxic masculinity isn't a project product of too much masculinity. It's a product of too little masculinity. Mm -hmm. Almost every one of the most toxic men I've ever met in my life, people I've given advice to in county jails and things like this, um, you know, and, and as a law school graduate, not as a fellow inmate, but I mean, like, all of those people, probably 90% fatherless, very similar set of issues. So that's important. Toxic masculinity isn't what a lot of people think it is. And I think further, we have a problem in this country of branding issues like homicide or suicide as white or black or whatever issues, when they're pretty obviously spread out across the board. We might have a worse problem as we one issue, the whites on another issue, something like that. But this, this sort of misraising of men crosses all ethnic groups. Like when you talk about this ADD thing, with the boys in the schools where like every third boy is on speed. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at the side of a bottle of Adderall, it just says amphetamine. The only other ingredient is salt. It's like amphetamine salts. So is that a good thing for most boys or are those just normal aggressive boys that are in that feminized educational environment and are being given this hard drug so they sit still? Um, and there, there's so many other issues, focus of police on young men, so on. But I mean, there actually are solutions to this from charter schools to military schools to in trying to get back to fatherhood, promoting marriage, actually enforcing the child support laws. But until those things happen, you're going to keep seeing those problems. 
And again, as re the everyone can comment on everyone else's issues, uh, just like we notice what a cruel person might label craziness in Caucasian communities, they obviously notice the violence in African American communities because it's all over the damn news. So when you ask when are there going to be more businesses in black communities, the, the moment that 13% of the population stops committing 45 or 50% of the murders, that's the answer. So we all have to work on these problems together, but that starts with being honest about them. We can't just pretend it's racism that makes a black cab driver not want to drive into a black neighborhood. Right. That, right. That's well right. said. Uh, Barrington, you want to tell us anything that you're working on? Or, or give us any parting shots, something you want to leave people with? Oh man, I just think that um, now more than ever, everybody just needs to do the self work. Um, at the end of the day, I know we like to like look for solutions in politics, and we like to look for solutions that are group oriented. But I really feel like the the work or what really moves the needle is when you do the work of you, within yourself. When you are honest about your flaws, when you're honest about you know the, your your downfalls as a as a person, as a human. Because I've always felt that. Like personally, in order if I would, if I ever wanted to move the needle in the black community, then that means I need to get myself together. Because if I'm if I can have myself together, then how would I be able to help someone out? And I just think that if you get yourself together and you allow or get with other like-minded people in value systems, and you guys do something together, then we'll start to be able to see the changes that we want to see in society. So you can check me out every Thursday at seven um, and every Saturdays at two p.m. on the Barrington Report. I have uh, a podcast coming out or school TV um, called Gentleman's Inc. And so these are basically um, speaking about issues from a heterosexual black male perspective. That's really cool. Um, got a couple of articles coming out coming out soon. I have I started my sub stack, um, everything and nothing where I'll be writing more so personal pieces away from politics, but just giving my overall commentary on everything that happens in life. That is awesome. Um, you got it there. He is Barrington Martin the second. Find him on Twitter at Barrington II the yes. second, and follow him. You'll get some uh, interesting conversations there, and Absolutely. watch him get attacked and be fun. Uh, thank you all for watching <laughs> and listening. Thank Will and Shamika for uh, joining us and thank uh, you. being here and having a great conversation. Barrington, yeah. you were awesome. Thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs>